Hello, my uh, name is uh, uh, Rindarji Singh and I'm a uh, stroke neurologist at Health Sciences North. I'm a regional director uh, at the North uh, uh, Eastern Ontario Stroke Network. Uh, and I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, uh, who is uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Avraj Deshmukh uh, here at uh, HSN. Uh, Dr. Deshmukh is a stroke and interventional neurologist uh, working at Health Sciences North in Sudbury since August 2021. He's uh, also assistant uh, professor at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. He completed his uh, internal uh, medicine residency in, uh, in India, as well as his neurology residency. And he did uh, one year intervention fellowship uh, uh, back in Delhi, India. And after that, he uh, moved to Austria to did uh, his uh, uh, interventional um, research fellowship. Um, and uh, uh, thereafter he moved to Canada where he did initially um, uh, non-interventional stroke fellowship uh, uh, with Dr. Shomashek. And uh, after that, he did a new interventional fellowship um, at Hamilton General Hospital uh, in Hamilton. And uh, he'll be uh, speaking on pathophysiology and uh, clinical presentation of uh, stroke. Uh, welcome, Dr. Deshmukh. Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Ayagaraj Deshmukh. I'm one of the stroke neurologists and neurointerventionists working here at Health Sciences North, Sudbury. Firstly, I would like to thank organizers for inviting me for the Stroke Symposium. Today, I'm going to talk about pathophysiology and clinical presentation of stroke. Following are my affiliations. And these are the learning objectives of my today's presentation. I have divided my topic into three parts. In the first part, I will discuss the different types of stroke, including what is meant by TIA or transient ischemic attack. In the second part, I'm going to talk about the brain anatomy, including cerebrovascular circulation and clinical symptoms of stroke. And in the third part, I will talk about time is brain concept. Stroke is a very important health hazard just because of the volume of cases, its burden on the society, and the way it affects the quality of life of patients we serve. This is the national data from a few years back, which showed that staggering 750,000 Canadians we are living with the effects of stroke at that point of time. These numbers are again progressively increasing on a yearly basis. Stroke affects both males and females equally. And although we consider this as the disease of old age, you can see up to 25% of these patients are below the age of 65. This is the latest data from our province. Stroke is the leading cause of disability and the third is leading cause of death. There are estimated 25,000 new stroke events every year, which is equivalent to one stroke every 13 minutes. Out of these 25,000 patients, 15,000 require hospital admission and approximately 20% of these patients die within one year of their stroke diagnosis. If you look at the financial burden or financial implication, it is one billion annual cost. Stroke is defined as a syndrome of acute onset neurological dysfunction caused by a disruption in blood flow to a part of the brain. Stroke is of two types. One is ischemic, and another one is hemorrhaging, and these two are dramatically opposite conditions. In the ischemic stroke, the artery supplying the brain is blocked, causing brain injury due to lack of blood supply. While in the hemorrhagic stroke, the artery supplying the brain is ruptured, causing bleeding in the brain, injuring the surrounding tissue. The CT scan on the right side shows right MCA ischemic stroke and the CT scan on the left shows 
इंट्राक्रैनियल हेमोरेज इशमिक स्ट्रोक्स कंस्टिट्यूट एटी परसेंट ऑफ द स्ट्रोक्स विच इज गोइंग टू बी द टॉपिक ऑफ फोकस ऑफ माई टूडेज प्रेजेंटेशन वॉट इज मीन बाय इशमिक स्ट्रोक वर्सेस पी आर तो एज आई डिस्क्राइब एन इशमिक स्ट्रोक इज डिफाइंड एज सडन न्यूरोलॉजिकल डेफिसिट विच कैन बी ट्रांसजेंट फॉर फ्यू आवर्स और परमनंट resulting from focal brain ischemia it is associated with permanent brain infarction which can be seen either on the ct scan or on the mri the ti on the other hand as the name suggests is a transient nature is a is a similar process but transient in nature caused by the focal brain ischemia there is no associated infarct either on the ct scan or mri in patients with pi the typical duration of pi is usually less than 1 hour but an episode can last up to 24 hours so if you look at it ti and stroke are actually a continuum of the same process if the patient has transient deficits and no infarct on ct scan or mri it will be called as a ti if the patient has transient neurological deficit but has a infarct on the ct scan or mri it will be called as a ischemic stroke again this happens quite frequently particularly when the duration of event is longer that even with transient symptoms patient tend to have a stroke on ct scan or mri and as we traditionally know if symptoms are persistent and there is an infarct on the ct scan or mri it will be called as a stroke it is important to diagnose an event as a ti as the annual risk of recurrent ischemic stroke after an initial ti is 3 to 4% in some patient the risk goes more than 10% in the first 7 days after di the estimated annual risk sorry the estimated 5 year risk is around 24 to 25% after an episode of di and hence their correct diagnosis and treatment is very very important i will try to explain this little bit further with these two cases the patient a is a 65 year old male with risk factors of hypertension coronary artery disease and 40 pack year history of smoking he presented with an episode of word finding difficulties and right face and arm weakness of total 2 hours duration the patient of b which is a 80 year old female with risk factors of hypertension presented with word finding difficulties of duration 30 minutes by the time both these patients presented to the emergency their neurological exam was completely normal so both these patients have transient neural deficit but patient a's mri showed a small infarct in the left frontal region so the patient a will be diagnosed as a stroke while the patient b will be diagnosed as a ti and again this is not unusual particularly if the duration of symptoms is more than 1 hour we have seen that 25 to 50% patients which such transient episode can have a stroke on their imaging so both these patients were investigated thoroughly and the first patient was found to have left eye cyst stenosis which was treated successfully with carotid artery stenting patient b was found to have atrial fibrillation which was treated with anticoagulation with apixaban both these patients are now symptom free for last 2 years so now you can see that early detection and diagnosis can markedly reduce future risk of stroke with associated morbidity and mortality
coming to the second part in the second part i'm going to discuss the brain anatomy its blood supply and some of the clinical symptoms based on that now we know the brain has an anterior circulation and the posterior circulation the anterior circulation consists of two arteries on the front which are called as internal carotid arteries the internal carotid arteries go up into the brain and divide into two branches one is called as middle cerebral artery and the other one is called as anterior cerebral artery the two arteries on the back they are called as vertebral arteries they join together to form a one artery which is called as basilar artery in this section you can see the artery on the front is internal carotid artery and the artery on the back are the vertebral arteries once these arteries enter into the brain they divide into multiple branches to supply this outer part which is called as cortex of the brain and there are these small arteries they are called as perforator arteries which supply the inner or the subcortical part of the brain if you look at it further if this is an imaginary line any area above it is supplied by the anterior circulation and the any area below it is supplied by the posterior circulation this is another image of the posterior circulation and it shows that these two vertebral arteries are joining together to form a basilar artery which then supply the area of the brain stem and the cerebellum going little bit further into it you can see this is the outer side of the brain which is supplied by these branches and this outer side of the brain is called as cortex so if there is any blockage in this artery it will cause a stroke in this part of the brain which is called as a cortical stroke these small arteries here they supply the inner part of the brain or the area of this structure called as basal ganglia and internal capsule and if there is a blockage in these arteries here it will cause something called as subcortical stroke as you can see the subcortical strokes or the stroke due to these perforator branches are going to be small because they are supplying the small area of the brain again the symptoms are very variable whether it affects cortex or it affects the subcortical region now the question is why the blockage happens there are three different processes by which blockage can happen in the brain arteries the first is called as thrombotic process where there is a local process leading to blockage in the arteries the second is called as embolic process where the blood clot in some other part of the body can travel into the brain and lodge into these arteries causing embolic stroke the third mechanism affects these small blood vessels of the brain the process is called as lipohyaluronosis by which the small small arteries slowly get blocked and the important risk factors for this process of lipohyaluronosis are age blood pressure diabetes mellitus and smoking now we all know the basic stroke symptoms the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body and the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body the dominant of, dominance of the hemisphere is decided by which area controls the language in right handed people the left hemisphere is dominant and surprisingly in most of the left handed people again the left hemisphere is dominant and hence 
a stroke in the left hemisphere usually leads to aphasia, particular and always when it's a dominant hemisphere. A stroke in the right hemisphere usually affects the spatial orientation, and these people tend to neglect their left side. So, there in patients with right hemispheric stroke, these people are looking away from their parallel slide. Now, this is a little bit more complex slide. This slide shows different area supplied by the different brain arteries. The area in purple is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery. The area in blue is supplied by the middle cerebral artery. And the area in green is supplied by the posterior cerebral artery, which is a part of the posterior circulation. You might remember the initial imaginary line I showed. Any part above and anterior to it is supplied by the anterior circulation. Any part below and posterior to it is supplied by the posterior circulation. So if there is a blockage in the middle cerebral artery, it will potentially cause stroke in this blue area. If there is a blockage in the anterior cerebral artery, it will potentially cause stroke in this purple area. If there is a blockage in these small arteries, it will cause stroke in this small subparticle area. The same applies to posterior circulation, but in posterior circulation, the, ana the anatomy and the blood supply is more complex than the anterior circulation. Now let's jump into the specific stroke syndromes. Area supplied by the middle cerebral artery is shown in the red balloon. And the stroke in right MCA or the area supplied by the middle cerebral artery will lead to contralateral lower face weakness contralateral weakness in the left arm and left leg, decreased sensation on the opposite side. In patients with dominant left hemisphere, a right hemispheric stroke will cause perceptual deficits. And if the stroke is on the left side, it will cause impairment of the speech. The area supplied by anterior cerebral artery is shown in red color. If there is a stroke in the left anterior cerebral artery, it will cause contralateral right leg weakness. Usually, the anterior cerebral artery territory supplies more leg than the arm. Sometimes, these stroke can be bilateral, affecting both of the lower limbs. Again, the frontal or the anterior part of the brain controls the behavior and any stroke in this area can cause slowness, disinhibition, and executive dysfunction. It also controls the bladder function and stroke in this area can cause incontinence. Let's come, come back to the posterior circulation. The area supplied by the posterior cerebral artery is shown in the green color. The stroke in the posterior cerebral artery will cause visual field defects in the opposite hemisphere or the opposite hemifield. Sometimes both posterior cerebral arteries are affected making patients blind. The posterior cerebral artery also supplies the small area into the brain. It is called as thalamus and any stroke into the thalamus can cause sensory disturbances. Sometimes it can cause aphasia and decrease level of consciousness.
patients with brain stem and cerebellar stroke have very different symptoms the dominant symptoms are vertigo gait ataxia diplopia nystagmus some patients might present with dysarthria and dysphagia the presence of cross sensory and motor findings is very classical for brain stem stroke and these cross symptoms mean means they affect one side of the face and other side of the body or the right side of the face is affected and the left side of the body is affected then it is called as cross stroke symptoms in some patients with brain stem stroke the presentation can be with quadriparesis and decreased level of consciousness and the diagnosis can be very challenging and difficult in some of these patients now coming to the lacunar strokes as i discussed before these strokes are due to the blockage of small arteries in the brain or perforator arteries in the brain as i said these strokes are small in size not necessary their symptoms are small one of the important feature of lacunar stroke is they don't have cortical symptoms such as aphasia neglect or hemianopia there are five classical stroke syndromes or there are five classical lacunar stroke syndromes they are pure motor stroke pure sensory stroke sensory motor stroke ataxic hemiparesis and clumsy hand dysarthria syndrome i will not go into their details so how do you know the patient is having stroke it is the acute onset neuro deficit which can be in the form of hemiparesis or hemisensory loss aphasia or neglect based on dominance of the hemisphere it can be a droopiness of mouth or slurring of speech patients can present with hemianopia or blindness and in posterior circulation the presentation can be with vertigo ataxia diplopia or gait imbalance the three important features of stroke symptoms is they are acute in nature the symptom is a deficit it is a loss of function of the brain and the symptoms are focal in nature based on which artery is blocked based on the clinical symptoms we should be able to tell whether it is anterior or posterior circulation stroke and whether it is affecting right or the left side of the brain now coming to the third part of my presentation that is the time is brain concept the stroke sub starts whenever there is an occlusion in the brain artery so it is important to know when the symptoms exactly started in this patient there is a blockage in the left middle cerebral artery so this is the left middle cerebral artery which is supplying the left side of the brain if there is a blockage here the supply to this part of the brain is compromised you can still see there are these small arteries in the surrounding area these arteries are called as collateral arteries and they can still keep supplying some part of this brain tissue so we come to a stage where there is a central part which is already dead and there is a peripheral part which is supplied by this collateral arteries which is although still alive can potentially die if this artery remains blocked this leads to a concept of something called as core which is an area where already there is an infarct and the outer area which is called as penumbra which is at a risk of stroke and our aim is to restore flow to the brain as early as possible to minimize the size of core if we don't do anything the core is going to increase in size and going to match the penumbra now how fast does that happen you will be surprised but the average speed is 1.9 million neurons lost every 1 minute if we don't do anything and that's why we believe that proceed as fast as possible 
until proven otherwise when you are dealing with the patients of the stroke. My last slide, the take home message. The hallmark of stroke symptoms is sudden onset focal neuro deficit. The recognition of stroke, RTI, is vital for preventing future risk of stroke. And time matters, so move fast until proven otherwise. Thank you very much. We can proceed to the question and answer section. Thank you, Dr. Deshmukh. We'll now take a few minutes for questions. So if people could please type your question into the ask a question box, and then I will read it out for Dr. Deshmukh. Just a reminder to click on the evaluation survey for this session. It can be found on the right side of your screen. So to start off, Dr. Deshmukh, can you clarify the difference between core and penumbra for us? Um. So in my presentation, I talked about it. Uh, that was mainly in my last part. Uh, the core and penumbra kind of forms the basis of whole acute stroke treatment part. I explained there, uh, but I will explain it here once again. So let's say a person uh, has a blockage in uh, middle cerebral artery. Now, as I mentioned, there is a middle cerebral artery and there is an anterior cerebral artery and there is a posterior cerebral artery. So whenever there is a blockage in middle cerebral artery, this anterior cerebral artery and the posterior cerebral artery kind of try to give a blood supply to that part of the brain, which is currently under stress or currently under the ischemia. Now there is some, so let's say the blockage happened at 8 a.m. So some part of the brain will get infected or stroke right away. It will, it will have a stroke right away and that forms our core. The area surrounding that part is under, is, is still ischemic but has not died yet. This ACA and PCA will keep supplying some blood flow to that area. Now with time what happens, let's say now we are at around noon time. So it's four hours since the initial blockage. In that four hours, slowly the size of core or size of infected brain tissue is going to expand because these arteries are there to supply, but they are not foolproof. They, they cannot sustain that, that kind of flow for longer time. So by noon, there will be further expansion of that core. If, if we don't treat that patient till 4 p.m., 5 p.m., there will be even further expansion of that core. Now, it's hard to tell which person will go from one point, which person will have complete damage to that territory or which patient will have a slow damage to that territory. So there we comes to two different concepts. One is called as fast progressor and one is called as slow progressors. Fast progressors are the patients who in which the core rapidly increases like those patients are in those fast pathway where we have to really really be very very fast in in their management in slow progressors the size of core slowly increases and matches the penumbra so the outer part is penumbra the inner part is core and core is slight slowly 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 expanding to match our penumbra and that's that's where the whole acute stroke treatment is organize that we want to establish flow in this artery before this core expands and matches the penumbra. Once it has mashed the penumbra or once the stroke is kind of complete, there is no, uh, there is no um, uh, benefit of any acute stroke treatment. Either it is an IV thrombolysis or, uh, or it's an endovascular thrombectomy. Dr. Dr. Singh will talk about it in, in a little bit more, but uh, this slow progress core penumbra slow progressor, fast progressor are kind of a uh, main element around which this whole stroke treatment is organized. And you can see uh, initially the stroke treatment was offered only till four and a half hours with IV thrombolysis. Then once we understood this core and penumbra, we expanded up to it up to six hours and it went up to eight hours. And now with some more sophisticated imaging, we are able to offer this up to 24 hours. And there are definitely some centers who are ready to offer it up to 48 hours. So very few selected patients where 
they are kind of a slow progressor mm-hmm. we can offer it for even longer time mm-hmm. really interesting great thanks for clarifying that um our next question is about the NIH stroke scale so why is the stroke scale important to do at the bedside so um NIH stroke i i i i really like NIH as a stroke scale it is it is kind of easy to do yeah anybody can do it it was it was initially uh, yeah, nih stroke scale was initially developed in 1995 uh, based on the initial tpa trial and then it kind of became a, a main part of the assessment of stroke patient it is easy to do it is repeatable and it can be communicated easily if you tell me an nih score is 10 it gives me an idea okay what is exactly happening with the patient and it kind of replaces the neurological examination if if you have any neurological patient it's not even uh, applicable for stroke anymore if you have a patient with intracranial hemorrhage if if you have a patient with acute stroke if you have a patient with recurrent stroke you can always kind of do an ihs score and it will communicate the same information and it will be the same uh, if you are talking to a nurse practitioner if you are talking to a physician if you are talking to a stroke neurologist lot of treatments are based on nihs score so overall the data is coming that if nihs score is less than 4 probably you are safe to manage the stroke conservatively on the other hand if the nihs score is more than 10 you have to be very proactive again if if somebody tells me the nihs score is 12 that patient has close to 80% chance of large vessel occlusion so it it has that kind of it it can roughly tell you what is happening on the brain scan as well if it is more than 10 it it tells me that oh patient might there is a 80% chance patient might have a large vessel occlusion between 4 to 6 it can be small vessel occlusion it can be a large vessel occlusion usually less than 4 as i said uh, stroke can be managed more conservatively again it helps in reassessment of the patient our whole our initial assessment is based on nihs score then we calculate it at 24 hour and then we calculate it at 3 month and that tells us which path patient is exactly going this is again sometimes uh, happen on the floor that there are sudden neurological changes and we don't know what should be the next step and how to calculate that change and that's where nihs help oh patient came with nihs of 6 and now the nihs is 12 this six point change in nihs score is considered as significant basically any 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 nihs score difference or change in nihs score of four point is considered as a significant nihs change and that can become a reason to kind, kind of contact the physician contact the nurse practitioner or consider a new imaging so um, it it is it is uh, kind of a may nihs score is a kind of a language of communication when you are treating a stroke mhm right really good great thanks so that's all the questions we have this morning so thank you again we uh, appreciate thank your you. time and the knowledge that you shared with us today thanks dr deshmukh thank you